how many of the murder cases we're about to talk about tonight do you think actually were caused by dog men? Well, as I was reading on the subject matter and starting to dig into it, what struck me is that I believed I was only scratching the surface of what's been taking place. There's some indication that dog attacks in general get underreported in the United States. For political reasons, the CDC wasn't necessarily doing a great deal of work to analyze animal attacks, especially of domestic dogs. And I believe local media reports often lack a follow-up investigation. So the cases that I focused on in my initial research are ones that struck me as being unusual or outside of the ordinary. Certainly people do get attacked by domestic dogs. It happens. There's no denying that. But I tried to focus on cases where it seemed that there was something strange going on and it seemed to fit a pattern that began to emerge. And what I came up with was mostly in the last 10 years, because I was relying on Internet research, of about 100 cases of individuals that I believe may have been a fatality related to something related to an unknown canine or a disappearance related to an unknown canine, and then around another 15 or so historical cases that I happened to find the information on that seemed fairly well documented that seemed to fit the same pattern. So you're talking with just an initial research of about 115 cases that I had serious questions about. Not too long ago, an animal attack occurred on the Wind River Indian Reservation. Let's start off talking about that case. Yes, the Wind River case is actually the one that got me started down this path, it was the proverbial rabbit hole that I started journeying down. Well, I said I'm in the Midwest. I'm actually in the state of Wyoming. So one of the first things I happened to do is I had been reading the latest Missing 411 book, and around the same time, I'd finished reading one of, rereading actually, one of Linda Godfrey's books about Dogman. And I was familiar with the general concept of people going missing under strange circumstances, strange disappearances as well as reports of unknown animals. So I simply started with a Google search. I typed in something like mysterious animal attacks or strange animal attacks in Wyoming, my home state. And that's what immediately brought me to the case of Deanne Lynn Coando Tavonis. News reports sometimes just call her Deanne Lynn Coando. She was a 40-year-old Native American woman, a part of the East Shoshone tribe, who was found dead in late 2014 on a large Indian reservation here in Wyoming. It's uh, the Wind River Indian Reservation. What struck me about this case was that the initial information on it that played out even through the local newspapers sounded like the openings of a horror film. The coroner actually went to the unusual step of issuing a warning for the entire area telling people essentially, be on the lookout, there's an unknown predator, consider keeping your children inside, and report any unknown or dangerous-looking animal, either domestic or wild. Please report that there's a public health threat. And I actually called the coroner there, and, and I'll leave his name out of it because I haven't, haven't signed an interview form or something, but he basically expressed that he did that because he thought that there was a threat to the public health and safety, and he wanted to go public with a warning in order that people in the area would know that something was going on. So essentially what happened is this unfortunate woman, she was found unconscious outside, and the initial report was that it was a dog attack. But when you dig into it, and I I do thank the reporters for the local paper because they had not a lot going on in terms of unusual crime cases, so they did actually do some digging that they reported in the paper. So when the woman was found unconscious with a faint pulse, the radio traffic of the first responders was actually overheard and made public. And what was happening was this woman was found badly torn up. There was a very faint pulse, so she was still alive when she was found. And initially they were unsure, oh, what do we got going on here? We have someone that's pretty much torn up. Sharks don't walk on land. What, what's happened here? Was this a crime? And they weren't sure, so they were treating it as a criminal investigation. There were unusual footprints of some type found in the scene, and I can't find out any more information as to what made them unusual. But I know that the scene where she was found was secured by the first responders because of a trail of footprints that they wanted to follow up on, and that no one heard anything. This was in an area that wasn't entirely remote, 
It was on the Indian Reservation, but there were buildings and a school and such nearby, but we had no witnesses. We had nothing confirmed that anyone heard screams. This woman was found around November 13th of 2014, so it was a fairly recent case, still fresh in everyone's memory. By five days later, the story was already in the paper that it was a pack of dogs that was responsible. However, it turns out that the autopsy results weren't even back in yet at the time that that was a story that was released. I was also able to find out just by poking around a little bit that a number of federal agencies were involved in this case right from the beginning. The Federal Bureau of Investigation normally does investigate crimes on Indian reservations, not necessarily accidents. And I was later able to get the coroner's docket report for this case, and it labeled it an accident. And yet, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Indian Affairs, and the Federal Fish and Wildlife folks were all over this area right after it happened. And there were reports of unusual black vehicles. We actually had the men in black out here looking into this, in that there were federal agents who weren't necessarily identifying what agency they were with, who were driving black SUVs, who within a day of this woman being found dead were parked in the area and were known to be questioning people. The local authorities were also told that the FBI was taking DNA samples, and yet nothing was ever followed up on that. And indeed, the coroner report that lists this woman's death says, actually I have it right in front of me, it says that the cause of death was an accident due to exsanguination consistent with dog bites. So it doesn't say that it was dog bites, it says it was consistent with dog bites, which I thought was Interesting. I also found it interesting that although this was called an accident, that you still had a lot of federal involvement in the case. Like you would think for an accident, like someone falling off the roof or being hit by a car. It also seems strange that although there have been issues reported with a fair number of stray dogs on this reservation, they've never actually attacked anyone before. And indeed, the Attorney General of the tribe, when contacted regarding the matter, had never heard of a real problem with dogs on the reservation. That they were there, but that no one had been attacked by them, no one had talked to her about it, she didn't know about it. And there was an allusion to dogs being killed on the reservation occasionally when they became a problem, but that no one knew anything about a roaming pack of dogs or had any reason to suspect that there would be a threat to people. And what was to be important later as I began to figure out a pattern to this was that the deceased was actually apparently intoxicated at the time she was set upon. She had a relatively high blood alcohol content. However, I'm not a forensics expert. and I've heard different things regarding post-mortem blood alcohol content can be elevated because of the decomposition of the body, depending on to when it was tested for. But I do believe that the woman was intoxicated when she was set upon. She appears to have been 40 years old and was otherwise in good health. So I think that being intoxicated was what identified her as a weakness to whatever ended up attacking her. Animal control in the area never did respond to an inquiry that I placed with them as to whether or not they'd had any other reports or anything of that nature. The Indian Reservation it happened on had been known for crime and drug usage, so some of the locals had actually referred to one street as Compton after the Los Angeles neighborhood made famous by NWA. So at first, individuals in the community thought that this woman may have been murdered or something like that in a rather conventional manner. And indeed, she was so badly mutilated that they couldn't determine it. The first responders were quoted in the radio traffic as, not being sure if these were animal bites or knife bites or she'd been mauled by power tools. But it would appear from the DNA sampling being done and from the coroner's report that something with canine DNA and something resembling a dog was what tore this poor woman up. And it was from there, after I learned about this, that I learned about other missing people who'd been in that same area of Wyoming who just vanished over the years under strange circumstances, as well as learning about other attacks of a similar nature that have occurred on Indian reservations that were then attributed to wild dogs 
and that saw a remarkable level of involvement of a number of federal agencies being involved in the investigation, yet with a final release to the public saying only that we had this death and then blaming it on local dogs. But with the people in the areas offering contrary opinions as to just how dangerous or how numerous local dogs were. Right around the same time in 2014, there was another case in the Pine Ridge Reservation, and it was just a week later after this first attack that I spoke about. There was an eight-year-old girl who was out sledding, and she was set upon and killed, and the story came out that it was by a pack of wild dogs. And what I found interesting was that the police did something similar to what the coroner had done in this first case we discussed. They issued a be on the lookout to the residents saying, We've had an unknown animal attack. Be on the lookout for an unknown predator. Report anything unusual, any unusual sightings of a wild animal, anything of that nature. And the police chiefs actually quoted in the local paper saying they'd never seen anything of this magnitude. And even though they released the story that it was a dog attack, no one seemed sure of the breed or number of dogs. And again, we had a case where there were no witnesses, no one heard anything. In this case, the local Indian authorities, it was a different tribe, but in this case it was the Navajo, took the unusual step of hiring outside contractors to come in and capture and euthanize a number of the local dogs. Some of these dogs were, in fact, saved by a dog rescue outfit. They said that a lot of the dogs being rounded up seemed to just be people's pets that happened to be on the loose. There was almost like a case of the usual suspects round up what we thought was suspected, and the animal rescuers were actually trying to rescue some of these dogs. They made an interesting statement to the media saying that they believed it was not local dogs that were responsible for this attack, but packs of what they described as quote-unquote night dogs, and there was nothing further to illuminate that, but apparently locals at this reservation felt that in addition to the normal random run-of-the-mill stray dogs wandering around the buildings, that there's some other kind of predatory pack or group of dogs seen only at night that were only described as large and keeping fairly mysterious ways, and that these were the ones that were actually eating people or that had eaten this little girl. They actually had a horse trailer truck full of dogs that had been shot after this case from the contractors that went in and just started cleaning up the stray dogs. However, none of these were ever linked to the girl's death. We never heard anything from an autopsy on any of the dogs saying, oh, we found human remains in the stomach or blood on them or anything like that. It was simply a case of these dogs are in the area and we need to blame something and it needs to look like we're doing something, so let's go ahead and pretend that we're cleaning this up. That was another one of the things that led me to think that there was something strange going on was the fact that it seemed almost as though a means to placate the local community and their question was offered up to try and find something that would seem plausible and get people to stop asking questions. And that led me to some other cases on Indian reservations. There was another reservation, the Rosebud Reservation, and this was about a year later, in the summer of 2015. There was a woman named Julia Charging Whirlwind who was found mauled to death. This was in White River, South Dakota, and it seemed to be the same situation that we have a lack of witnesses, we have someone being found dead, we have federal agencies coming in, taking DNA tests, isolating the scene, and then we have local law enforcement saying that it's just a problem with stray dogs, we'll get it taken care of, and the later sheriff was later quoted as having shot and killed two dogs that were never presented to anyone and never tied by a DNA or human remains or anything else to the death. It was all actually very vague. It seemed as though in some cases it's happening on an Indian reservation, it's not a site, it's not a mine. They just would prefer to stay that way, and especially because federal agencies are the ones that are handling these investigations for the most part, that there's a curtain of silence that then falls over the death beyond the initial media reporting attributing a strange death to being related to dog attacks. What kind of people are normally attacked in these instances? The pattern that I seem to come across suggests that a predator is at work, a predator that selects victims 
and takes the elderly, the very young, or someone who is in some way impaired, either with a physical handicap, a mental handicap, or has caused themselves to be impaired via intoxication or drug use, that in essence something is ticking off the weaker members of the herd, especially when they're isolated or in the way of the predator while they're trying to get to something else such as domestic animals or domestic pets. In some of these death cases that we'll cover tonight, it seems as though the individuals who ended up being killed in an attack had themselves been around dogs, raising dogs, and were well familiar with them, and had, in the time period right before their tragic deaths, reported a strange number of missing pets or attacks on their livestock or pets. So it would seem as though there's also a predator that preys on the domestic animals of humans, and then if it's confronted in such a way that a human becomes a problem for it, is not afraid to attack, especially what appear to be weaker or isolated humans. It also has a habit of picking off people when they're alone and early morning hours, I also discovered seem to be a time, it seems that dawn and dusk seem to be key times where a lot of these things seem to happen. You have attacks in the early morning, then you have attacks around the time of sunset. So that would suggest a predator that works at night and that shuns broad daylight, I would say, that almost as though there's an intelligence behind the attacks that whatever takes these people tries to avoid witnesses and tries to avoid being seen. As we'll discuss in some of the attacks, whenever there has been a witness, they've only made vague reports along the lines of seeing strange dogs or large dogs or large-headed dogs. And what I think is going on is that even when people see something that they don't know how to process what it is they've just seen, no one wants to seem like a crazy person, so they just try and frame it in a format that's familiar to them. In these cases, we should look at, well, Is there a pattern emerging? Is this something that keeps going on? And does it seem like there's efforts to investigate it that aren't being made public? And that's what got me started down the rabbit hole. When you hear about how brutally some of these people were attacked and killed, it sure makes you wonder how these attacks played out. Moving on, though, I understand one case that you've researched really stands out in your mind as being extraordinary. I'm talking about the case with Natalie Adams. What happened to her? She was an 81-year-old woman who lived in Georgia. It was a somewhat rural area surrounding woods and such, but by no means was it the middle of nowhere, and by no means was there no one around. She did have neighbors nearby, and this woman was fairly spry for her age. She had a habit of going out in the morning to collect cans for recycling. I'm not sure if she was doing that for the money or she just liked the environment, but every morning she had a habit of going out and picking up cans. And then one morning, unfortunately, something got to her while she was out picking up these cans. She was found very badly mauled. And in this case, there was a law enforcement response, but beyond the first responders, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, rather than the federal government, was involved. It was known that they took DNA samples, They cordoned off the scene and seemed to be paying a great deal of attention to this, much more so than if anyone had been hit by a car or some other kind of an accidental death. Natalie Adams was found in the ditch at 8.32 on a Tuesday morning. So, again, we're with an early morning attack. There were no witnesses. No one saw anything. The body was very badly mutilated. We know that DNA swabs were taken, and we know that what autopsy results were released said that they believed it was caused by a dog attack and that the injuries were horrific. But beyond that, no dogs were ever caught. No one was ever charged. We have weasel words by the authorities saying autopsy results were consistent with a dog attack, but not saying it was a dog attack. In this case, the authorities put out baited traps and worked with animal control to play the usual suspects and try and round up a few dogs. Yet no one ever caught an animal that found human remains in its stomach. No one saw any dogs with blood on them. No one saw anything of that nature. 
we just had a woman who was going out on her daily routine, suspected nothing, and bam, something got to her. The authorities themselves, the GBI, described it as a very unusual death, to say the least. And here we have a woman who's in good shape. This shouldn't have happened to her. If the media reports say she's killed by a dog attack, yet if a number of dogs had set upon her, why did no one hear anything? Why did no one see anything? Why weren't dogs seen in the area? No sound of barking, no noise, nothing. Just an attack seemingly out of nowhere. And now we have a dead woman who was described as being shredded, being found in the ditch right off of the road she lives on. Barely, I believe, it was like a half mile from her own home. And then we have a lack of follow-up from law enforcement. We know the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was there, not just the county sheriff but state law enforcement officials. And there was also rumors that the FBI was present. So if we have just something simple like a dog attack, why do we have state and federal authorities involved in taking DNA exams? Why wouldn't it be a matter just for the county sheriff? And why does no one see anything? There was evidence of a struggle found nearby. We had broken yard furniture, blood everywhere. And again, something that was to show up in many of these cases is that clothing was torn off of the victim, that the victim was found missing most of her clothes, which seems like the whatever predator this is likes to rip through or rip off clothes. And that tied me back to what I'd read before in some of the missing 411 cases in David Police's excellent series of books that unfortunately raised more questions than it could provide any answers, that a number of times when people were found missing under mysterious circumstances and a body is later found, that they were strangely either partially or fully unclothed or missing items of clothing. That poor woman, I can't even imagine what she must have gone through. Yes, it's, it's a tragedy, especially considering that she was just going through her normal daily routine and then apparently a predator may have been stalking her or may have been stalking the area or even laying in wait for her. Yeah, it doesn't get much more tragic than that. How about the Reverend John Reynolds case? This is another interesting case where the usual suspects seem to be blamed. Reverend John Reynolds was a man who was very well familiar with dogs. He, in fact, ran a dog rescue. He'd been known to rescue pit bulls, foster them. He certainly knew his way around large animals. And yet he was discovered dead, very badly mutilated, in his animal enclosure. Now, you would think, well, and this is, I believe, what the media reports wanted people to think initially was you think, oh, well, that's too bad, but his dogs must have got to him. The problem with that is his son, who had the same name, reported to the media that in the days leading up to this, they had trouble with something trying to, an unknown creature trying to get in through their fence to the domestic dogs that the Reverend was actually fostering and raising. And they actually had, at the time they found his body, they found his pit bull, his favorite dog, dead, very badly mutilated. I mean, we're talking about a large animal. We're talking about an adult male pit bull had been mutilated and was also dead nearby. And then two additional female pit bulls were found in a state of what they described as being like shock. They were found hiding nearby as though something had greatly spooked them. The Reverend's son suggested that these reports that it was his dog that did it were foolish because here's the dog's in the enclosure and you have one dead, and you have two badly traumatized. They don't have human blood on them. They obviously haven't been eating them. And something had been trying to get into this enclosure to get to these dogs, almost like something was viewing them as prey in the days leading up to this. The Reverend's son suggested that a mountain lion was to blame because something, whatever it was that got in there, was able to penetrate fences that kept multiple pit bulls from wandering out and then was able to kill one adult pit bull that apparently just decided to defend its owner and cause two others to run and basically hide and flee for their lives and not come back out until the crime scene was being secured. So it certainly didn't seem to me like a case of an individual being killed by their dogs. It seemed as though something was preying on the dogs, using them as a prey animal. And then unfortunately the Reverend Reynolds got in its way or tried to stop it or was just in the wrong place at the wrong time and also fell victim to it. It seems that when these cases happen, that even local law enforcement is shocked at the level of severity and the level of damage done to these bodies, that 
there's been reports of people looking like they're victims of power tools or shark attacks or things of that nature. That the words seem to almost fail the first responders in terms of trying to describe the carnage that they encounter. We know in some cases that body parts have been literally strewn about the area. I'm sure that media reports get sanitized to a certain extent, but I've run across descriptions saying things like arms and legs were basically strewn about the area. You're talking about scenes of intense carnage, that just people torn apart, organs missing, limbs torn off, just terrible mutilation to the point where sometimes there's even an issue with identifying the body. One of the classic cases I ran across was back in the 1960s, where we had a woman who was reported as being killed by her own dog. She was in the habit of raising show Doberman, and eventually her dog was blamed, and her dog was shot by the local sheriff. However, the problem is that here, as in the Reynolds case, the actual dog that was eventually blamed was found in hiding when the sheriff got there. The dog was basically cowering in fear and did not seem at all aggressive. This case was interesting, and it's hard to find exact details since I was relying on older newspaper accounts, but it was known that the woman's house was essentially devastated. She was in her 60s. She lived alone, but was known to be in good health, and her house was devastated. We had signs of a struggle. It looked like there'd been, according to some witnesses, a war inside of her living room. We had smashed furniture. We had lamps pulled over. We had evidence of an extreme struggle. We had broken glass. We had dishes thrown about. It looked like she literally had fought for her life. And what's interesting about that is also, even though her dog was eventually blamed and shot, no one mentioned finding her dog being wounded or torn up or in any way bloodied or harmed. So it would suggest that something got into this woman's house and attacked her, and it looked as though, from the way the struggle was laid out, that she would either had been attacked at her own front door or was trying to get to the front door and get out. The newspaper accounts weren't specific as to which scenario was the case, but obviously this woman had to send a dog to her house. It was a place that was known to have dogs, and here we have somewhere even in her own house. Keep in mind, this is in the woods that she was found dead. This isn't someone disappearing on a lonely hunting trip. This is someone in their own home that is actually found with their home torn apart, their furnishings torn apart, and themselves torn apart and badly mutilated. And their pet, in this case a large Doberman, is essentially hiding, frightened out of its mind, and ends up getting the blame for it simply because no one seemed to have been quite sure what to make of it. It obviously wasn't a person, and her wounds did resemble those of a canine attack, albeit much more severe and much more devastating. You told me in the pre-interview that the first responders described the crime scene as looking as if a monster had been set loose in her house. Yes, I believe that is what the local sheriff was quoted as saying. That it looked like a monster had gotten in there. I believe they also described it as looking like a war zone. And since this was the 1960s, you're talking about individuals and local law enforcement who would have been World War II veterans who certainly had seen real war zones, had seen real carnage, and had no other words to describe what they were seeing. It obviously did not seem to be a human predator because that's why they used the term monster. And what conjured to my mind was, of course, the classic Hollywood fair of the beast gets in the house and there's a battle, and in this case someone didn't get away or wasn't able to fight it off. That does paint a pretty ominous picture. Please tell us about the Daryl Roberson case. Daryl Roberson was an interesting case. And this happened in the Internet age, so we can actually find some information about it online without having to dig through dead newspaper journals. What we have here is we have an individual who's 42 years old. It's not known to me if he had any kind of impairment, but he was found in the early morning by his local paper carrier doing the route. He was found dead. In this case, we actually did have witnesses in that the paper carrier reported two unknown large dogs were chewing on him, on his body. These dogs were never found. Police were quoted as saying they were relatively sure that they were Roddy's or Doberman's because the report said that they were basically large black dogs. A neighbor had described Daryl as a big guy, that they weren't sure how this could have happened to him. Police estimated that the attack took place in the very early morning hours, either at dawn or just before. And this was another of the cases where we had local police 
giving a be on the lookout warning to a local neighborhood and that they actually said to people in this general area, they said, be careful about letting your children out. We have an unknown dog or dogs on the loose. We're not sure where they are. We're not sure who they belong to, but you need to keep your children in for right now and we'll just take care of this. So you had an individual who's going about their daily business and something, again, sets on them, just attacks them out of nowhere. This is one of the few cases where it seems to have been a healthy adult male who should have even been able to put up a fight, and even he was not safe, that he was just torn to bits. So I don't know if he got in the way of something, if something took him as a prey of opportunity, or what had happened, but here we have someone prowling in the early morning hours. They're out by their own home. And they are set upon. Um, There was some suggestion that Daryl, too, had been out searching for either recycling or cans. That He was prone to do this in the early morning hours. I guess that's when the pickings were good. And that's when he was set upon. And so it seems to me that individuals who are out in the early morning hours, they should be aware that North America is not a tame place, as we would like to believe. There are still things out there that do take people, that attack people, that eat people, that maul people, and that strike at certain times of the day, that many people should just keep an eye out over their shoulder. I mean, if nothing else, if if someone doesn't believe in Dog Man or Bigfoot or any cryptid whatsoever, what I would like them to take away from all this is that people are, in fact, in late 20th, early 21st century America, being taken by predators, being killed in their own neighborhoods, being horrifically torn apart, mutilated, and devoured, and that there's something out there. If you say, oh, dog man, that's that's crap, that's nothing, there's no such thing as Bigfoot. Okay, I'm fine with that. Let's say the authorities are telling the truth, and that there are all these random packs of unknown large dogs wandering America. I still want people to just think to themselves, wait, why does this keep happening? And maybe I should keep an eye on my kids. Maybe I should keep an eye on grandma. Maybe I should keep an eye on myself when I'm out, especially at these times of the day or by myself. If I could add one more thing about the Daryl Robertson case, it would be that very much this was not in the woods. It actually took place in the suburbs of Tulsa, Oklahoma. So you have not a remote wilderness area, not some frontier wilderness like people imagine exists in Alaska or Canada or here in Wyoming, but you have the suburbs of a major American city, and we still see these attacks taking place. One of the disturbing cases I ran across was an older case. It was from May of 1959. There was what was really a toddler. His name was Mark Draper. He was killed by what was described as a pack of seven to ten large dogs. Now, what made this case interesting, and again, it was a case where I only found older newspaper accounts, was that a posse was actually formed to hunt down all the nearby dogs. About 100 to 150 people took to the woods with their rifles and shotguns. This was at the height of the Cold War. So what happened is the local civil defense wardens, the people who would have been responsible for shuffling people in shelters and maintaining order in the case of a Soviet missile attack, actually went around and the local block wardens organized everyone, got everyone who could hold a rifle or a shotgun out, and combed the woods and shot all the usual suspect dogs they could. At least 15 dogs were killed and three were captured. What we know is very little beyond that, and that witnesses describe only that there was a large black dog or several of them that was seen. It was suggested that the police and civil defense were out there, and it specifically mentioned in the newspapers at the time, riot guns, which were shorter-barreled, high-capacity 12-gauge shotguns, were out searching the woods. But with this boy, again, his clothes were torn off and ripped to shreds. The boy was missing. He'd been out playing. The mother had just gone inside for a few minutes to do something, thinking nothing of it, thinking her son, well, he'll be safe. This is late 1950s America. Crime, animal attacks, like that certainly is not anyone's mind. This is the era of the Lone Ranger. This is Howdy Doody. This is a relatively peaceful time, especially in suburban America. So she goes inside, then comes back out, can't find her son. So she asks one of the neighbors, go and look for him. She's one of the neighbors out working in his yard. He goes out, he actually is the one who's described seeing a large black dog chewing on the boy. 
He armed himself with what was described as a club, and I'm not sure if this was something he fought with him, or more likely it was something like a large stick or branch on the ground, and approached this one large dog he saw, and actually appears to have made physical contact with it, beating it to get it off the boy's body. It wasn't entirely clear from the older newspaper reports if this is a case of this was one of the animals that was attacked. One of the newspaper reports described this as a pack leader, suggesting that there were other animals waiting just out of eyesight in the woods, but that the gentleman only happened to see this one or challenge this one animal. No specific breed was mentioned. It was mentioned only that we have a large, dark-colored dog. And here you have a little boy who, basically in the safety of his own yard, goes missing because something snatched it. The fact that the animal or animals broke off the assault when confronted by an armed adult male would suggest to me that Mark Draper, who was a little more than a toddler, was taken as a victim of opportunity precisely because he was weak. And that for whatever reason, here again we have the case of the clothes are missing, torn off, strewn about, and that seems like an awful lot of dexterity for a normal dog. I've had in my life dogs come up to me and try and bite me. I've actually seen other dogs try and bite people. And usually dogs don't try and undress their victims. They don't have opposable thumbs. They don't really have the ability to do that. They just kind of latch in and bite or claw at. They're not specifically being concerned with stripping their victims. And I'm not sure why this is going on. I'm not sure why that's important to them. Maybe clothes taste bad. I honestly don't know. But it certainly is something that's happening in these cases. Back in the late 1950s, people would try and handle things on their own of this nature. I don't know that the federal government would have been something that would even occur to them to go to. They probably legitimately did think it was large dogs, I believe, in this case. And that's why they decided to do a bit of good old American self-help. And the local civil defense people took it on themselves to start handing out rifles or shotguns and round up everybody with a gun and take to the woods, because they certainly thought it was something strange going on, and they wanted to take care of the situation. And this was near Hazelwood, Missouri, that this happened. So you'll find information about it. And if someone's in the area, they can probably find out even more about it than I was able to, from possibly the St. Louis papers. A lot of the news reports were dayline St. Louis on the Mark Draper case. And it's something I'd like to find out more about myself, because here we have what seemed to be an organized response. And I'll admit that there's a possibility that perhaps there was a federal organized response here, too, because it was the local civil defense apparatus, the people in charge of responding to an enemy attack on the domestic heartland. There was no homeland security back then. It fell under the umbrella of the civil defense agency, were specifically mentioned as being involved, and that the local police were breaking up their riot equipment. So it seemed to be something much more seriously going on than anyone concerned about a single stray dog. A single stray dog, even in the horrific case that it was killing a small child, you would not think that that would require uh, posses of over 100 armed men to comb through the woods to look for a single dog. It simply is mind-boggling that, I guess at the time, this is pre-Watergate, pre-Vietnam War, people weren't as likely to question things as they were settled for an explanation. And obviously, with a hundred or more men prowling the woods, the local media report had to say something happened. So they simply said they were looking for a pack of large dogs. Yet, we know there was at least one large dog. We don't know anything about a breed. All we know that's being officially reported is large dog, unknown type. And here you have a mass of almost militarized response to it. Can we backtrack just for a second? Sure. The woman who was torn apart by the dog in her own home, that was Frances Tetterault. I actually just found the page. The one that raised the show, Dobermans, it would happen in New Jersey. Something happened in Lynchburg, Virginia in the late 1960s. It was in 1967, around December 17th. And the month of December would become important because the November-December time frame seemed to be to me when a lot of these attacks were being reported, and I still don't know how significant that is. This is another case where we have two young children. They're out playing. You have Eugene Goodman and his brother, Kenneth, four years old and three years old, out playing in their yard. Mother sends them out playing. Dad's doing his yard work. Now, what's interesting is that before this happened, there had been reports that pets had been being killed in the area and turning up missing. 
So there was some suggestion that maybe something strange is going on, but certainly not enough that people would think about it to keep their kids indoors. So the boys are out playing. In this case, the mother actually did hear something. She never heard the sounds of animals, but she did hear the sounds of her children screaming. She immediately runs outside, says to their dad, Oh, my God, where are our kids? What's going on? The dad still has his rake in his hand. He runs out there, and he finds his children out there by a nearby creek, just beyond their backyard, being torn apart. He set upon what he described as large, dark dogs that were doing the attacking, armed with nothing but his rake, and again, was able to drive them off. Because here again, we have two small children, barely more than toddlers, set upon as a target of opportunity. Since there were two of them, I believe that's why one of them was able to scream loud enough that their mom heard it. In a lot of these cases, we have no witnesses, no one sees anything. I think that because there were two, that one of them was able to get these screams out that their mom heard. And I think it was also because their dad was nearby and was armed to some extent, even with just a rake, that whatever set upon these boys, whether it was one animal or group or whether it was just dogs or whether we're talking dog man, they immediately backed off when confronted with an armed and fit adult man. And these creatures were described as being like large, dark dogs again. What my theory is, and I can't prove it, but what my theory is is that some of these cases we're seeing attacks by, for lack of a better term, a juvenile dog man. A creature or creatures not yet totally experienced but that are unwilling to take on an adult human or intelligent enough not to stick around on the scene once an adult human, particularly an armed male, sets upon the scene. As we'll discuss later with some other cases, I don't believe that being an armed, healthy male is necessarily going to protect you, but I believe that in some of these cases where you're seeing the young, basically children, picked off, that once resistance is offered, that it will end the attack or end the incident. And I think that's important to realize because it would mean that people aren't entirely helpless, that there are things that could be done simply by being aware and prepared. Yeah, I'll bet you're right on the money with that. I know of several instances where armed men were firing at dogmen with pretty potent weaponry and the dogmen still advanced on them. So what you said about the whole juvenile thing there... You're probably right. Moving on, let's talk about the Kevin Zook case from 1980. Kevin Zook is another one of these cases that, as soon as you read about it, you're struck by this almost seems like a scene from a horror movie. Here we had young Kevin. He was a teenager, so I I don't know if we should call him young. He was 14 years old at the time. He'd been out riding his motorbike, and we're talking about rural Illinois. So we're not talking about the great wilds of Alaska or something like that. We're talking about Midwestern American farm country. The boy's out riding his motorbike, which was his hobby. It's 1980 America. It's a fairly safe place. You're in a rural area. No one's expecting anything to happen. Everyone believes that all the large predators have gone away long ago and that no one believes the crime to be a real issue, certainly. So Kevin's out riding his motorbike. He runs out of gas. Now, they know this because they later found the motorbike out of gas. Uh, He parks it nearby, and he goes over to a nearby farmhouse, and he knocks on the door. And unfortunately, no one's home when he knocks on the door. If there was, this whole thing could have turned out probably much differently. So the story picks up when someone does return home, and what they find is just a horrific scene. They found an actual trail marred by unknown paw prints, bloody footprints, and bits of human flesh and clothing where it appeared that something had attacked Kevin right near this door, caused him to flee into a nearby cornfield, running for his life and leaving a trail of blood and carnage in his way. And there he's found dead. He was missing about 24 hours by the time he was found. So he'd been pretty badly torn up, and they found him in the cornfield. So we have paw prints, we have bloody footprints, and here's another case where he was found nearly naked. About all he had on was on one foot he had a shoe, and on the other foot, he had a sock. He had over 100 bites. There were bloody paw prints found in the mud. And we have this boy who's just set upon, on a mundane day, something appears to have been prowling this farm, perhaps looking for domestic animals, perhaps marking his territory, perhaps scouting. I'm not an animal psychologist. I don't know. 
and sets upon poor Kevin. He runs for it. He runs for his life. He runs through the field. He tries to get away. He tries to hide whatever he's trying to do. But here you have a healthy young man. He's 14 years old. He was an outdoorsman. He's gone out on his dirt bike. He's been going around. You'd think he'd be able to put up a fight, yet whatever thing or things got him was able to run him down and tear him to bits, basically out in someone's farmyard. It's just a tragic case. But again, we have the victim stripped naked, paw prints, dog-like injuries. Local dogs, again, got the blame in the media reports, saying, well, he must have been set upon by some local farm dogs. But at least unanswered the question of, well, where are these vicious farm dogs? Who did they belong to? Why wasn't someone charged? Why weren't the dogs found? It's just mind-boggling that you could say, oh, well, it must have been dogs. Well, this doesn't sound like just a case of some farm dogs, because no one else had been torn apart. The people who lived on this farm weren't torn apart. But you have this boy who's out just enjoying himself for the evening, and his life comes to an end because something, something strange happened. He's set upon, he's stripped of his clothes, he's run down like a game animal, he's chased down, and he's just torn to bits and partially devoured. There's an author named Jan Thompson who related a story that was really similar to the one that you just talked about. I don't know as a fact that her story is true, but the story has this kid riding his dirt bike through the woods. A dog man jumped out and grabbed his leg. He gunned the bike and took off. He was able to race back through the woods, get out of the woods, and ditch the bike in front of his house and race inside to safety. As you were telling me about this story, I was thinking about all the similarities and everything. As I've been listening to these stories that you've been sharing, I've been trying to put my finger on which one is the most disturbing. The next case that I'm going to ask you to talk about involving Angie Nickerson in March of 89, that would have to rank close to the top. Please tell us about that. Angie was just a kindergartner. She was just over five years old, and she was actually torn apart after getting off her own school bus. And that's one of the things that really bothered me. She got off the school bus around... 11, 30 or so, and she was found dead two hours later by the mail carrier. The news reports stated that she was, quote, chewed to the bone and it resembled a shark attack. There were no witnesses, despite the fact that this is 11.30 in the morning. It's in a part of Michigan that's rural, but by no means desolate. You have an area that's presumed to be safe because they're not going to let you off the school bus. I've got children that age myself. They usually let you off the school bus essentially right in front of your house or within sight of your house. So you had this little girl torn to ribbons within sight of her house, almost unidentifiable. Her clothes were torn to bits. No witnesses actually saw the attack. When the mail carrier found the body, they did see two neighborhood dogs sniffing around her clothes that were still there when state police arrived. So essentially they just said, oh, well, it must have been neighborhood dogs that did it. However, these dogs, they were pretty much just investigating the strange scents and the carnage at the scene. They weren't found blooded. They weren't found with human remains in their stomach. And these were pet dogs. These were dogs that people kept. They'd certainly never eaten their owners. They'd never tried to eat a child before. And you have just this little girl. She should be safe. She goes to school. She's had a nice day at kindergarten. She's getting off. She's coming home. And then, bam, right there, within sight of her house, something, some predator, had to have set upon her, and it had to have worked fast, and it had to have worked quietly. It had to have taken her such that her screams couldn't have been heard by any neighbors, and that no one saw anything, that no one remarked on anything. It was bam, it was ambush predation. One of the strange things that struck out to me, I don't know if this means anything or not, but the number of attacks seemed to happen around Christmas time. When I was a boy, I had a book about werewolf stories. I'd gotten it through Scholastic Books or something like that, and it had the notation that, that werewolves were said to be active around Christmas time. I'm not saying that that's what's going on here, but I just found it strange that some of these things seem to happen around that very time. So maybe the old folklore may have had a bit of truth to it. Certainly again on Christmas Day, April 1997, when young April Edwards, she was only five years old, suffering from a cognitive disability, she was playing near her grandfather's trailer, she was described as suffering from a cognitive disability. I'm not sure exactly what that entailed. Obviously, she was in some way slightly impaired. She 
she's playing on the yard. It's Christmas Day. No one's going to suspect anything's going to go wrong. And suddenly they go out to look for her, except she's not there. Eventually, the search did turn up. Her body, again found dead, horribly mutilated. Neighborhood dogs, again, get the blame. Because, well, what else is it going to be, is likely what a lot of people were thinking. What else could be in this area that would take someone out of their own yard? There's no bears in this area. There's no mountain lions, no wolves. We have what looks like dog bites. But, again, we have no witnesses. No one heard her scream. Something seems to have grabbed her out of her own yard, taken her, and assaulted her, and just torn her to bits, all in the space of what must have been a very brief time. Because you had her grandfather actually indoors, and he was reported to say that he didn't have his eyes off her for more than 20 or 30 minutes. You have something capable of striking within a matter of a very brief time frame, making off with a child taking them to a nearby area, and badly mutilating the body. That struck me as having a level of subtlety, a level of planning, and a level of intelligence to it that did not sound like the work of a pack of neighborhood dogs or random dogs that would think to be laying in wait to take someone. It's almost as though it was deliberate predation on members of the human species. Yeah, these cases are just so hard to describe. It seems like they raise more questions than answers. I have only a pattern that certainly strikes me as alarming. I can't say this is this, this is that. It's in a way it's similar to the missing 411 cases, where I think David Politi's did an excellent job of establishing that there's cases where people go missing in the woods when they shouldn't. I'd like to establish and get people to realize that there's cases where people are vanishing or being mauled, mutilated, killed, eaten in modern America. It's being blamed on dogs, but there's questions that would suggest that maybe this isn't your normal run-of-the-mill dogs, or certainly not your average household pet that's responsible. I hate the fact that that's happening, and unfortunately, dogs that aren't responsible for these deaths were killed. In 2001, Rodney McAllister was found dead. Please tell us about that case. This is yet another case where you have a younger individual. He was only 10 years old. This happened near St. Louis, Missouri. The boy was found dead in the park. Again, his clothes was torn off. And the newspaper report described him as being, quote, literally eaten, unquote. Neighbors, when the police canvassed the area, said they heard sounds of what well, they reported to be suffering. And they never nailed down what suffering entailed. The report only said suffering. Two hours after the boy went to play in the park. What essentially happened is his mom sent him to play in the park. She was at home, figured he was 10, didn't think anything of it. No witnesses actually saw this attack. Local random strays were blamed. In this case, to add to the mother's tragedy of losing her son, she was actually faced charges related to poor parenting for letting her son go out to play in the park without keeping a watch on him. I was not able to determine in my initial research at this point whether she was actually convicted or not. But she lets her son go play in the park. It's a park. There's jungle gyms. There's play sets. You know, normally there'd probably be people around. For whatever reason, there wasn't, or he was at the edge of the park. I still haven't nailed down why it was that he was taken. But certainly there were neighbors within earshot, because in hindsight, they've heard something strange, something they described as suffering. And here you have a 10-year-old kid near St. Louis. He goes out to play, and he's eaten. Something took this boy and to quote the media, which was putting the authorities, literally eaten. This is 2001 Missouri. This is the wilds of India. This isn't, again, the wilds of Alaska. You have, again, clothes gone, child taken in a short period of time, no witnesses, no sound, nothing, and dogs end up being blamed, which I suspect is because, again, in these cases, you're having canine DNA is what's turning up as well as wounds very much like dog bites or, in the words of some of these corners, consistent with dog attacks, but much more severe, much more horrific, taken more to a shark attack. In the cases of seasoned law enforcement professionals, like nothing they've seen before or warranting a be on the lookout for the area or to call out an armed posse, that there's something very strange going on. For them to describe the crime scene as looking as if a shark attack had taken place, that says it all right there. 
In 2005, Lydia Elaine Chapel was found suffering from hypothermia and was unconscious. Please tell us about what happened there. Here we have someone who's younger. This is again in rural Illinois, the same as Kevin Zook, suggesting that, again, we hear about the classical Michigan dog case or the Beast of Bray Road or these reports from the Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois area. That's one of the reasons this stuck out in my, in my mind. Lydia had snuck out, perhaps to see her boyfriend, perhaps for some other reasons, early in the morning. Her parents, as soon as they noticed her missing, it was about 6.30 in the morning. So again, you have these early morning hours. They found her not in her bed. They saw she snuck out to go see her boyfriend or something. She was found in the ditch at 7.30 in the morning. Now, they officially chalked this one up as death due to hypothermia. Now, it seems odd to me that someone who's healthy in Illinois, even in the winter, would have frozen to death within an hour. But what's interesting is that when she was found, they initially thought she had been hit by a large car moving very fast because she was just that badly torn up. She's laying in the ditch. She's torn up, ripped up, just very badly bloody. She was still alive when they found her, but was never able to make a statement. And then she's only been out there for at most an hour, and yet in this case they didn't even go with the usual report of dog attacks. They said, well, it was hypothermia that killed her, and she just happened to have also been attacked by one or more large dogs. In this case, it just struck me as mind-boggling that it could happen this quick. Now, what I saw myself wondering when she was missing from her bed, I saw myself with the creepy thought, what if something actually took her from her bed or took her from her house or otherwise lured her out of that house and got to it? Because there was never any definitive proof as to why she left or why she was missing. All her parents knew was that she'd gone to bed that night. They knew she was in bed. They go to look for her that morning to get her up to go to school or get up for the morning or whatever. And suddenly she's not in her bed. She's missing. They do the responsible thing. They contact the police. They put a search out. Oh, be on the lookout for our daughter. She's not in her bed. She's gone. She's missing. We don't know why she's gone. We don't know what happened to her. And within an hour, within one hour, she's found dying, mutilated, laying in a ditch. And it struck me as being very strange that this happened. And I honestly wondered, did something, in fact, have the intelligence? So we know that there's been people killed in their own home. We know that the dog's been blamed. So I found myself wondering, did something even possibly take her out of her own bed or lure her out of her own bed that morning? And I don't think we'll ever know. All we'll know is that something got to her. They initially thought it was a car, and then they report, no, it's dog bites. It's canine DNA. It's, it's a just a scene of terrible mutilation again, and it all happened very fast. And it seemed like one of those cases where even being in your own yard or even your own home isn't necessarily a guarantee of safety. We know something killed her. Again, if people want to say, oh, it wasn't Bigfoot, it wasn't Dogman, it wasn't any of this. Okay, so what was it? There was certainly something out there that was dangerous. Something that set upon this teen girl in today's America, not so long ago at all, and was able to do damage to her in a very short period of time that made it resemble someone being hit by a car, which is just a weighty animal, a large animal, a very vicious attacker, was able to get to her and cause sufficient loss of blood that I believe the loss of blood was actually probably the real cause of death, but that the loss of blood tied in with the hypothermia. But she certainly wasn't out there for long, no more than an hour. So it's just, it, 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 it bothers me. This is another one of those cases that just kind of bothered me, that someone's gone from their own bed. But it seems almost like there's no safe place. That's one of the things that kind of keeps me up at night, thinking that, be you in the suburbs, be you in the woods, be you even in a large city, that there's people being taken, people being horribly killed, even out of their own home, their own yards, that there really is not a safe place. This is something that just sticks in the back of your mind as being alarming. And that's putting it mildly. We have quite a few we still need to cover. The first case I want you to tell us about is the Amy Jo Rowe Bechtel case. Yes, that one was right here in Wyoming. I believe she was actually covered in one of David Politi's Missing 411 books. And I think she's been the subject of several TV documentaries of those kind that run on the cable news channels that along the nature of disappeared. Amy was a fairly young woman. She was in excellent condition. She wanted to be an Olympic marathoner. 
she'd been married for about a year to her husband, and she went out one day to run errands and never came back. Her car was eventually found, and it was found along a trailhead. Near as anyone can tell, her gym was going to be having a marathon in this section. Uh, it was near the mountain. And it's actually right near the area where our very first case we talked about with the Wind River Indian Reservation. It's actually right in that same general area, except this was sometime before. This was in 1997. And so, as near as they could tell, they found Amy's car out at the trailhead. It looked like she'd been scouting the route. It was an area she'd been in before. Um, she was in excellent physical condition. And her car's there. Her purse is there. Keys are there. But she's not there. It's almost as though she got out of her car, walked a little ways up, and just vanished. And to this day, she's never been found. She's one of these people who is going through their daily life, and something just snatches them up or snatches them away. Police actually looked at her husband initially because they ran out of other theories. He got a lawyer, so that delayed the process of them looking at other suspects. But he did eventually pass a lie detector test and was cleared. There's been other theories saying, oh, a serial killer or a mountain lion, something like that. But here we have another disappearance over a period of time in the same area where we know we've had some unusual fatal animal attacks. So it just struck me as making me wonder if some of these people that we hear about that go missing and are never found, if this is what ends up happening to them. And I can't say that specifically what happened to her. But I found it very interesting that she was in the same geographic area that we had one of our other cases. And I haven't had a chance to research extensively the topic of missing people in the area where some of these dog attacks came up. But I have a feeling that if this is something else that someone else wants to look into as well, that they're going to find that in some of these areas where we've had these reported dog attacks, that I would posit are not really dog attacks, but are something else, that in some of these areas you're going to find strange missing persons cases or people just going out to do their business one day and then, bam, they're never seen again. Can you imagine being her husband? Someone comes and notifies you of your wife's disappearance, and then next thing you know, the police are investigating you for the murder? That's horrible. I think he was in a hard spot. Some people would blame him for getting a lawyer and only answering questions to the lawyer, but I don't know really what else he could have done, especially being innocent. The lie detector test eventually cleared him, which people say that there's problems with those, so they're not scientifically admissible. But the police obviously thought it was good enough because they stopped looking at the suspect after that. But it did take quite some time, and it illustrates the way that when things that are strange happen, police and authorities naturally try and look for a pattern that they're more familiar with. Thus, if someone's badly mauled or eaten, they'll try and think, well, that must be dogs, that must be bears, that must be something like that. Or if someone vanishes, they try and look for a conventional explanation, saying, oh, well, must have been a foul play or something of that nature. Well, I'm glad the police department decided to lay off of him after that lie detector test. That had to be a really tough time for him. In your research, you found out about a myth that the Shoshone tribe had about a shape-shifting wolf creator god. Please tell us what you know about that. Yes, I'm not an expert on Native American mythology, but I found it interesting that the Shoshone tribe is one of those that's at the Wind River Indian Reservation, and they have a long and storied history of the importance of wolves in their tribal culture. One of their creator gods is actually a wolf that would take human form and that in their stories they say created mankind and then would then come and visit the people or the tribe in the form of a man. Some of these myths seem to be that it's a shapeshifter that takes human form, whereas others would suggest that it's a wolf walking upright with a man's head, which I believe is also a motif showing up in other Indian cultures, that there's a definite history in North America of wolf-like deities wolf-headed deities, wolf-creator gods, wolves that are considered to have some kind of supernatural powers or be in some way possessed of human characteristics. You know what they say, where there's smoke, there's usually fire. With all these Native American legends such as that one, it sure makes you wonder if there isn't something to them, and that's how they came to be. Please tell us about the Lothar Carl Schwager case. Lothar and his wife, were actually both killed. They were somewhat older, you're talking about in your 60s or 70s, but still in very good health. 
here you had a couple that was running a sanctuary for dogs. So they'd raised dogs, they were familiar with dogs, they'd had large dogs. Now what's interesting is that their large dogs started to go missing. In fact, Lothar's wife was out one morning in her car searching for one of their pit bulls that had vanished, and she was driving along slow down a county road. Correction. She was walking down the county road looking for the dog, and something happened to her. She was attacked by what the police said were a dog or dogs, but she was very badly mutilated, very badly mauled. Lothar was out driving, apparently also trying to help in the search for these dogs that have been going missing. Near as they can tell, he came along the scene, he parked the car, he got out, and there was what was described as scenes of a scuffle. It looked like he had been trying to fight off whatever was attacking him. He was able to get his cell phone out, but he was not able to place a call. So whatever got to him was able to take on a man and take him down before he could even push a speed dial button to call 911. There was a great amount of bloody footprints where apparently he was trying to fight, and he went down into the ditch, and that's where they found all sorts of large paw prints, which led to the theory that it was some kind of large dog or dog that was doing this. What's interesting in this case is that even days after the attack, a reporter for the New York Daily News was out at the scene and remarked that there was a very strange and very powerful odor still lingering in the area, which of course brings to mind various reports of Dogman, Bigfoot, and other cryptic creatures where people complain of these strange and unusual overpowering odors. And here we also have a case that's like some of the others I mentioned where it seems as though animals were going missing or disappearing, particularly domestic dogs. You had people who were well-experienced with dogs, who knew about dogs, who you'd think wouldn't be, wouldn't be prone to fall prey to a dog attack. And yet here they are, both being killed. Within a very short period of time, you have two adults killed, torn to ribbons, no witnesses, no one hears anything. We know the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was there. We know they were taking DNA samples. But... All we have released to the public is, well, it must have been a pack of wild dogs. Never mind that no one had reported a pack of wild dogs in the area. Never mind that no one saw a pack of wild dogs after this. They needed an explanation, so they made something fit, is what it seemed to me happened in this case. In instances where you have the GBI on scene investigating a case, do you know of any times when the FBI has also showed up to help investigate? Or if the GBI is on scene, does that mean that the FBI won't intervene? It seems as though there's been a number of these cases in Georgia, and it was specifically mentioned that the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was always sending agents there. On a national level, you'll see the FBI agents involved in pretty much all the cases on Indian reservations. The FBI does have jurisdiction over major crimes on Indian reservations, so if it looks like a homicide or certain other crimes they have jurisdiction over, they will investigate. With an animal attack, while it's possible that the local field agent would go out there if it was just a pedestrian animal attack or someone fell off their roof changing shingles or something just to basically check the box to see what happened with his unintended death, once it was ruled accidental, the investigation would stop. However, you'll find with some of these animal attack cases, that you'll have the FBI involved throughout the investigation. There's reports that even after the coroner's released the information, oh, this was an accidental death, it's an animal attack, that you still have FBI agents in the area questioning people, as well as reports of things like black government sedans and individuals who aren't necessarily identifying themselves as being with specific agencies, but saying, I'm agent so-and-so, and did you see anything, did you hear anything, you know, what do you know, just asking questions. That's why I refer to it only half-jokingly as the men in black show up with some of these cases. That it seems like there is, in some cases, a federal response that you have either agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation or other unnamed agencies present, including cases where you wouldn't think they'd have jurisdiction. I've been able to find out that there's been reports of FBI agents on the scene of some of these animal attacks that did not happen on Indian reservations where the 
Federal Bureau of Investigation would, in theory, not have any jurisdiction or not have anything to do with the case that was just a, a normal animal attack, if that's what it was. And I've heard from researchers in the Bigfoot community that they sometimes run across the same thing, that when something strange happens, that they soon find out that the FBI has been on the scene or other federal agents have been on the scene questioning people or securing an area or taking evidence, and yet it's never entirely clear what agencies are involved or what they're trying to do. So that is certainly something that's given me pause in some of these cases. It seems like in Georgia they've had enough cases of it. It almost seems as though there's a unit with the Georgia state authorities that they've designated to respond to these things and try and take evidence and secure scenes as opposed to the federal level. That's interesting. Let's talk about the Israel Pope Jr. case. This is another case with an elderly gentleman. This happened back in 2007. Um, Israel Pope Jr. was actually 96 years old, so he lived a long life, but he was known to still get along on his own, still walk to the store, and to try and maintain you know, independent living. Then one day he simply didn't show up. His relatives didn't find him at home. No one could find him seemed to have just walked out his front door and vanished. Approximately three days later, they found his remains in the nearby woods. The coroner actually said they may never know the cause of death because he was so badly mutilated that they couldn't establish what precisely killed him. They knew that he'd been ripped apart, that he was basically literally, in this case, torn limb from limb and partially devoured. And near as anyone could tell, he was another one of those cases where he walked out his front door one day and something got him. There's no way to tell the time of death, whether it happened in the morning or at night. He was known to take morning walks. So I'm wondering if this is another one of those early morning attack cases. He vanishes, and then three days later, we find his remains in the woods. Local authorities eventually released, well, it must have been some kind of dog attack. Yet no dogs were ever found. No dogs were ever presented. No one was charged in the matter for letting their dogs run around loose. Nothing like that happened. You just have an old gentleman going about his routine. And one day he's never seen again. And in this case, he's found. And when he is found, he's been eaten. They have to tell the public something, so they say it was a dog attack. For all I know, it was a dog attack, but I just find the circumstances mysterious as it's beginning to fit a pattern that I think is emerging with some of these cases we're discussing, wherein people, particularly those who would be elderly children, those with cognitive impairments, or those that would, for some reason, show a weakness are essentially being taken from the herd by an unknown canine predator. And this is another one of those cases where we know that DNA samples were being taken. There were suggestions and comment columns from local papers that it was canine DNA found. But nothing's done in the way of follow-up beyond a media release that, yes, this is terrible, someone was killed by dogs. There's no in-depth coverage beyond that. It's almost like the media wants to drop the case. Coralie Suhead is another one of these cases where you have a child that goes out to play in an area that's presumed to be safe, their own neighborhood, their own yard, a park, and suddenly they're gone. In this case, Coralie Suhead goes out to play. This is 2007. She's out there for only a little while when the adults go to check on her. She's gone. They eventually found her in tall grass about 100 yards from her home, and she's been mutilated, again, torn to bits, shredded, partially devoured. Now, in this case, they initially thought, well, there's a neighbor that has pit bulls. It must have been his dog. They must have got loose and got to it. So that was the story they initially ran in many media outlets. And you'll still see this today in some of these cases. If you look them up, you'll find media reports saying, oh, well, this is a pit bull fatality. But the interesting thing in this case is that the dogs that were the neighbors that they tried to blame it on in this case, the owner stood up to him. He said, well, no, this wasn't my dog. They didn't get loose. They didn't kill her, et cetera. So there was testing done on these dogs. They were examined to see if there was blood on them. Their DNA swabs were taken. And sure enough, the dogs that initially in all the media coverage said, oh, it was these pit bulls, it wasn't them. They were cleared. And then no other dogs were ever suggested as being the culprits. So again, we have either the case of either something was watching to take a child when they were at their most vulnerable, or we have a random pack of dogs in an area that no one's ever seen, no one sees during the attack, no one hears, and no one ever sees again. This is another one of those cases where I can't say, was this dog man, was this 
actually just random dogs, but just fits the pattern of just a strangeness and really makes you want to take a, a, keep a close eye on your children if you have young children when they're outside. You just take nothing for granted, because even if you want to say that there was no unknown predator responsible for some of these deaths, you still have something that's taking and killing children from their own yards in 21st century America. That's certainly worrisome. You can't argue with the fact that these deaths are happening. They're very brutal, very tragic. So it becomes a question of what's going on here? Can we prevent it? Is there anything we can do? And regardless of what anyone might think as to what might be the cause, I would just urge, just keep that extra eye on your children. Maintain that situational awareness. Anastasia Bingham's another case, a six-year-old child. We initially blame pit bulls again. They say, oh, well, there were some pit bulls in the area. And the media coverage will say, oh, here's a pit bull-related death because it fits a pattern in the media that people are familiar with that they could identify with, with all the stories about how pit bulls are dangerous and people will think it's a tragedy, but they'll be able to relate to it. They'll be able to classify it and file it in their head. And yet here again, we have the dogs that are initially said to be blamed, neighborhood pit bulls, eventually being cleared. And that part gets buried in the fine print weeks later in the paper where there'll be a front-page story that says little girl killed by pit bulls. Maybe two, three weeks, even months later, there'll be a fine print story like, oh, local pit bulls cleared in death of young girl. In this case, the pit bulls were cleared. It wasn't them. But you have a little girl. She goes out to play. She's six years old. No one sees the attack. No one hears anything. And by the time someone comes out and finds her a short period of time later, she's been killed, torn to bits, badly mutilated, and partially eaten. So it becomes a question, again, of what's doing this. It becomes where you, you just don't want to be complacent anymore with your children, where when you think all the predators and all the dangers are gone, here's something that's still out there. There's still something killing children in America today, especially young ones, vulnerable ones. And I've said it before, I think it's something picking off the weaker ones from the herd that there's a predator at work here. Brayden Carson was four years old. He was out in his own yard, and something took him. His aunt was quoted as saying in the media that whatever happened had to have happened in a 10-minute window when his mother went to take a shower and wasn't watching. During this 10-minute window, he apparently went outside into his own yard and just vanished. He was found laying in tall grass only 90 feet from his front door, and he had been torn to ribbons, partially devoured. And again, no one saw anything. No one heard anything. His mother had called it in almost immediately as soon as she noticed him missing, and the searchers came to the area and began searching the area. And yet here he is found within sight of his own house. You're talking 30 yards. He could have he should have been able to see his house. If something grabbed him from his own front door, I don't know if he was lured outside, if something attracted him outside, or why he decided to go outside. Maybe he was innocent. Maybe he was going out to get his toy. I don't know. But something got to him in 10 minutes. It was only 10 minutes, they said, that he wasn't being supervised, that he wasn't being watched. He goes outside. Something gets him from his own yard. So my question is, what was there? What was there hiding in tall grass near this boy's house? Was there something watching the house? Was something planning this out? It seems almost like there was a certain intelligence, almost as though something knew that there was a small prey animal in that house and knew exactly where to hide, where to attack from, and where to take its kill. And again, we're told that this was random dogs that just happened to be in the area, that there's just random dogs wandering through suburban neighborhoods that tear apart children. And to me, that sounds almost as unbelievable when you hear how it's being said to have happened again and again and again, that it seems as though Dogman or an unknown canine predator becomes almost less unbelievable than the idea that all parts of suburban America are harboring packs of wild, carnivorous, child-stealing dogs that no one ever sees and that are somehow able to keep their presence secret, or that are able to attack silently and in a matter of minutes, grab people. That, to me, is about as mind-boggling as the idea of an unknown canine predator doing this. But we're told that it was dog bites. We're told these dogs got the boy. 
but it bothers me. This one really bothers me because it was such a short period of time, and his mother was, by all accounts, a very good mother, tried to keep an eye on the boy, tried to keep him safe, and she took her eye off him for just a few minutes to do something that she'd probably done hundreds of times before, except this time something got him. And it really makes me wonder, are we safe in our own houses? You hear these stories of dog man trying to tap at windows or peering into windows or trying doorknobs. I'm starting to think this might be why they sometimes do that, is that they're looking for a good victim. And I'm thinking that sometimes they're finding these victims, that they're able to, if they're able to find a target of opportunity, that some of them will take it. And that is what I think may have happened in this case. When you have to worry about being safe in your own home from one of these things, that does take it to a whole new level. Please tell us about the Mary Jo Hunt case. Mary Jo Hunt's another one of these interesting cases where we have someone who is engaged in the habit of rescuing and fostering dogs who ends up torn apart in a dog attack. Now, in Mary Jo Hunt's case, we have confusing stories playing on the local media. It's known that she actually had 10 to 15 dogs in her home and that she did have several pit bulls. And in the end, the pit bulls were what was blamed. But what we know happened raises several questions. Mary was apparently out in the yard. She was working with her dogs, as she did many other times, feeding them and doing some yard work. She had a rake handy. We know that. So presumably she was actually cleaning up some of the dog poop. At this point, we know that it appears that she had a pug that was attacked. Now, the official story is that the pit bulls that she'd had, some of whom she'd had for years, suddenly turned on her for no reason. But what we know is that something attacked and chewed up her pug, that she had rake in hand, and that she tried to fight. Now, in this case, witnesses did hear a commotion. So her neighbors came over, and they saw what appeared to be large dogs. And they were very confused as to what breed they were. They thought maybe they were her pit bulls. And yet, no one could really identify what the breed were, but other than it was some large-headed dogs were chewing at her. So they called the sheriffs. The sheriffs come out there, and when they open the enclosure, the dogs all go running out as though something had spooked them. So no one's even sure exactly how many dogs were back there. Some say 10, some say 15, but they know that whatever was going on, everything ran out as soon as the police got there. Mary's body was found. She'd been fighting with her rake. She'd obviously put up a fight. But what's interesting is her clothes had been stripped off. And this is another case where we have a victim who all their clothes seem to have been methodically removed, which seems a strange behavior for dogs to be capable of. And we also know that because she put up a fight, one of her arms was ripped off. And again, some of her dogs returned home after this. And among the dogs that returned home, there were some pit bulls. No one analyzed their stomachs or did anything like that. They did notice some blood on several of their coats, which could, of course, have happened if there was a struggle in their pen. And so the official story was, well, her pit bulls must have turned on her. And so they put her pit bulls down when they returned home. And I'm not saying that isn't what happened. It's possible. But we have several things that are unusual. We have another one of those cases with someone who rescues dogs, breeds dogs, is familiar with dogs, has been around dogs for years. And we have their dogs get attacked by something or go missing. And then this person apparently gets in the way or tries to fight or tries to stop whatever's taking the dogs. And then is killed. And this is yet another case where the clothes are missing. Those who are fans of the missing 411 books will recall a number of cases with strange disappearances where people turn up and they've either undressed themselves or their clothing's out of order or it's been completely removed or is nowhere to be found. So it just struck me as a couple of red flags in this case where was it really the pit bulls or was that just the easy way out to try and explain something that was very out of the ordinary? Is that just the box that we had to put it in in order for people to feel safe at night? The fact that you said she was dismembered makes me think it wasn't a dog that had killed her. I don't know how much damage a dog can do when it gets its mind set to it, but it seems unusual that we keep hearing these cases where not only are the clothes removed, but with arms and legs being just torn away. That seems like a lot of strength for 
a domestic dog. Thomas Henning is another one of these cases that we find happens around Christmas time, and I still don't know if there's any significance to that. It's just it stuck in my head, as I mentioned in the last show, that when I was a kid, I read a book about werewolves, that werewolves were active around Christmas. And Thomas Hennio went missing and was found dead on December 26, 2012, the day after Christmas. And this is on the Navajo Reservation. So again, we have the Native American time. So this is the second of two cases where it was said that he was out sledding. Apparently he was out. It's winter. There's snow. He's out playing in the snow. He gets separated from his friends. He's out with his sled. The friends come home. He doesn't. A search result. They go out there. They find what's left of him. And unfortunately, it's in the case of what's left of him. Torn apart, badly mutilated. I believe he was eight years old. And he was the one who goes missing from a group, almost as though something was watching, waiting for him to be separated, waiting for him to be out of earshot, out of sight. No one hears anything. No one sees anything. We have a bloody mess. We have paw prints. We know the FBI was there. We know the Bureau of Indian Affairs was there. We know Fish and Wildlife was there. But all that's ever released was that this was an accidental death, and he just happened to have been torn apart by dogs. Again, one of these random packs of wild dogs that apparently range all over the countryside. In this case, I thought it was interesting that the other children that were with him, they all came back, but when he got separated, that's when something got him. And that it had to have happened, again, in a short period of time. It had to have been a relatively noiseless and sudden attack. Because no one heard anything, no one saw anything. They just figured he was coming along later with the sled. He'll be along shortly. Almost as though whoever's last in line, the slowest of the pack, gets kicked off. Betty Clark is another case where we have an elderly person who's out walking in their own neighborhood. And again, we have another case that's near Christmas. This one happened on December 21st of 2013. Betty was in her mid-70s. She was walking alone in her neighborhood. And again, we have it blamed on pit bulls. We have no witnesses. No one sees anything. And yet we have someone turns up relatively close to their own home, ripped to shreds. The neighbor's pit bulls were initially blamed, and that was what the media coverage was in big headlines when the story broke, was elderly woman killed by neighborhood pit bulls. And yet again, the pit bulls that were initially blamed, they're cleared in the case, and then no other dogs are put forward as a suspect, and the story becomes a fine print headline days later in the back of the paper. Dogs suspected in mutilation case cleared, and the media and law enforcement just seems to dismiss it, but almost as though there's no publicized follow-up investigation. Nothing happens other than we have someone torn apart on their daily routine, someone who's older, so would presumably represent less of a threat. No one sees it. No one hears it. And then we have law enforcement simply says, well, it was pit bulls or it's neighborhood dogs. We see this again and again in these cases where when people are picked off, they rely on sloppy media reporting to just generate a headline and then not follow it up because the corrections follow days, weeks, even months later saying, no, these animals that we thought did it, they didn't do it. That gets relatively little public. What sticks in everyone's mind will be that, well, this is just a pit bull related death or this is a tragedy, but it's something we can understand. And yet, what we really need to take from these cases is that the deaths themselves are happening. We know these deaths are happening. We know people are being torn apart. And we know it's happening so suddenly and so near their houses that it would suggest that something, whatever does this, isn't afraid of humans precisely and is willing to come in areas where there are humans and will actually wait in neighborhoods or areas of human habitation until a good target of opportunity comes out that it will then strike suddenly kill, mutilate, partially devour, and then vanish. Jessica Norman is one of these interesting cases in that she was an adult woman in the prime of her life, really. She was in her 30s. She was found torn apart and killed in a pasture very near her home. It was basically what amounted to a vacant lot nearby. We know that she used drugs, and she was found with methamphetamine in her system. So I believe that this is a case of impairment. Jessica went out to this area to use drugs. And this altered her perceptions, obviously. Now, we know she'd used here before. So if something was scoping out the area, maybe it knew this was her favorite spot or maybe new prey would come along. There's some indication that other people would use this vacant lot to use drugs. There's a lot that's gone to pasture. So you have tall grass, you have a certain amount of concealment. 
Jessica goes missing. Once the search begins, it's relatively easy to find her because they go check out thinking, well, maybe she's just using drugs, maybe she's passed out. So they find her remains in the field where she liked to use that. But the math isn't what killed her. What killed her was apparently being torn apart. And she's found, again, stripped naked, limb from limb. At first, they weren't sure, well, was this a crime? What could have happened here? I believe one of the local law enforcement officers was quoted as saying they thought it looked almost like a bear attack. It's eventually blamed on wild dogs. The wild dogs that no one hears anything, no one sees anything, and that aren't ever really spotted before or after. Yet here again, these mysterious wild dogs have torn someone apart. And I believe Jessica Norman was a victim because I don't think that whatever's doing this, these unknown canine predators, I don't think it will normally select otherwise healthy adult humans, either male or female. I think it will only do that under certain circumstances, like if they sense an impairment or if they really know to the extent, and I'm speculating as to what their mindset would be, but almost as though they have to be extra sure they can get away with it, that they won't take as many chances as they will when they grab a child. Is that the only case in Florida like that you've turned up in your research? In Florida, it's hard to say. I'm still separating the cases because you have a lot of what's called pit bull-related fatalities in Florida because it's a popular breed there. As we've looked at with these other cases, a lot of times the initial media coverage says pit bull case. turns out to have not been a pit bull or to not have had definitive evidence of a pit bull. So I would say there's some cases I want to look at more in Florida that were media-reported pit bull incidents that I have questions about, but that I can't definitively say that they fit the pattern or not at this point. It's something I want to look more into. Something else that I want to look at with the Florida case, I I actually used to live in South Carolina, so the same thing was taking place in South Carolina, is that you had cases where alligators were blamed in some of these cases for human mutilations or deaths, and yet you had this pattern of no witnesses or missing clothing or people going missing, and it seemed almost as though a case to blame whatever animal might be nearby to serve as the usual suspect. So I also wanted to look at, in Florida, whether or not certain cases said to be of alligators, whether or not there might be more to that, or whether the mutilations showed patterns that just didn't seem consistent with alligators. Because we know alligators will take people, and usually if they're doing it, they're going to drag them somewhere and want to eat on them. But if you have people that have just been torn limb from limb and were told an alligator, there was cases of that that I also wanted to look at. So I would put a big question mark on Florida that if there is an area, if there are areas where these things seem to be particularly active, I think it may be some of these southern states and that we just don't know the full story yet. So in areas like Mississippi, South Carolina, the deep south area, and we've talked about a lot of cases in Georgia, I think all the way down there into Florida, there may be clusters of these going on, and we just don't know the full extent of it. I can understand why the authorities would have a knee-jerk reaction and suspect an alligator was responsible for the killings in areas where alligators live, but when you look at how the people's bodies had been maimed, alligators kill and maim in a totally different way than a canid would. After any period of time, I can't understand why a coroner wouldn't instantly recognize that Gators weren't responsible for these deaths. Having said that, please tell us about the Summer Sears case. Summer Sears is yet again one of these cases where you have, in this case, a four-year-old girl. She was staying with her grandfather. She was playing in her grandfather's backyard. Now, the official story that came out was that one or more loose dogs brutally attacked her. That sounds a little vague, doesn't it? There's a reason for that. It's because, again, no one saw anything. No one heard anything. Her grandfather was actually in the trailer. He thought she was four years old. He wasn't too concerned about it. He was letting her play out in the yard. This is actually another case where we have the victim so horrifically mutilated that the police chief was quoted as saying that he had first thought it was a bear attack. DNA swabs were taken, the wounds were analyzed, and the closest anyone could say was that they believed it was a canine that attacked her. Now, there had been some people who had seen loose dogs in the neighborhood, but it was never confirmed that any of these dogs had done it. No one was ever charged. Some dogs were seized, but they were cleared. No one said, oh, this dog did it, or this dog did it, or the neighbor's dog did it. It simply became, well, something grabbed this girl from her yard, something tore her apart, something killed her. 
something so horrifically that we at first think it's a bear that did it. Some large mammal has done it. So what are we going to chalk this up as? How can we explain this? What can we call this so we can sleep at night? So it becomes a matter of saying, well, we know we saw dogs. We know dogs are a real thing. We know dogs exist. We know these wounds look kind of like that. So it must have been dogs that done it. And yet again, it's a case or play in your own yard. The adult's not there, almost as though something waits for its chance. You have an area that's only semi-rural. You have some tall grass, some trees, but you're not talking about deep woods. You're talking about suburban America. And we have a young child, what apparently makes for an easy target of opportunity, who just in a relatively small period of time when they are unsupervised is just taken and horrifically mutilated and killed either for sport or for food. And it's one of those things that really makes you want to keep an eye on your children whenever they go play outside. It makes you want to look out the window. It makes you literally want to stand out there while your children are outside. Oh, I'd say so. As far as the possibility of it being a bear that had killed these people, when you look at all the evidence that a bear is going to leave at a crime scene like that, I don't see how you could come to that conclusion. They're going to leave so much evidence behind that you couldn't mistake it. Please tell us about the Christopher Malone case. Christopher Malone was three years old, and this happened relatively recently. This was a 2014 case. And this is yet again where we have a young child playing out in the yard. The parents' pit bulls were to blame. And this happened in Mississippi, so it's the Deep South, which is my theory that in some of these areas of the Deep South, maybe a, almost a cluster area where these things take place. And it seems as though the stories reported in the media vary. Was it really these pit bulls or not? What we know happened is that we have a young boy, his parents did own pit bulls, but he's out playing, something grabs him, something tears him apart. He's essentially horribly mutilated, just torn to ribbons within a matter of a short period of time, and no one hears or sees anything. The reason they blame the parents' pit bulls is because they found blood on him. I think in some of these cases, what happens, happens either when the animal's nearby, or that a sympathetic animal will simply approach and sniff or investigate oh, hey, here's my owner, or here's this child that pets me every day, it's laying here dead, that they'll go in and sniff or lick or otherwise have some contact with the body once it's mutilated, causing the blood transfer to the animal, that then that animal will then get the blame, even though it wasn't necessarily responsible, even if the animal had no history of attacks, and that it will lead to people skipping the step of actually autopsying the animal after they put it down, to see if there's human remains actually in its stomach, that they rely on very superficial clues, such as blood, that they're finding canine wounds, canine DNA, paw prints, and that if there's any nearby dog, that they can say, this is what we think did it, the dog ends up being the patsy for the case. Yeah, when you were telling me last week about all the instances where dogs had been killed when it was clear they weren't responsible for the deaths of those people, That really didn't sit well with me. I hate the idea that that happened, but I'm not surprised. I mean, the authorities have to have some kind of a scapegoat and something or someone to blame the murders on, so I guess I shouldn't be all that surprised. I think some of the investigators, in their own mind, have a way to close these cases that they need a rational explanation. We talked about how there may be something going on at the federal level where there may be people who know that there's something not quite right going on in these cases there may be something strange but on a local and state level i think that some of these investigators are conscientious police officers are doing their job but that they need a way to sleep at night too they need an explanation that they can wrap their mind around and not being familiar with this pattern not having any idea how often this kind of thing is happening you feel bad for the dogs who are put down but you almost sympathize with why this is happening it becomes understandable because no one's been exposed to the pattern. No one has an idea just how much this takes place. Oh, I agree. I definitely understand it, but that doesn't mean I have to respect it. I just hate the idea that it's been happening. There was an incident near Mexico City where five people were killed. Please tell us about that incident. The cases in Mexico are interesting because they suggest that this is not just a North American phenomenon. I've heard instances of your radio program with reports of these things all over the world. And here we have them down in Mexico. Obviously, people think of Mexico, they think, well, there's crime down there. These kind of things must happen. Except here we have a park that's outside of Mexico City. It's abutting a rural area, but it's a place where couples go, kids go to make out, etc. And you have over a period of months, 
five people showing up either singly or in groups of two, badly mutilated and torn to bits. Now, in Mexico, there's less trust of law enforcement than there is here in the United States. There's the old saying that in Mexico, the police have the choice between either silver or lead. Either they take the bribe or they get shot. So people tend to question whatever the police tell them. Now, in this case, almost from the beginning, people were questioning, well, is there something strange going on here? Are these murders? Why are these people turning up badly mutilated? Why is this continuing over a period of months? If it's a pack of dogs, as is the official story, well, then why hasn't someone found these dogs? Why haven't they been trapped? Why are these attacks happening? Almost why aren't these attacks happening more often? Because if the park's played with packs of wild dogs, there's people out here all the time, yet something's apparently just grabbing people. In one case, it was a mother and her young child. In another case, it was a boyfriend and girlfriend. In the other cases, it was teenage girls. In one of these attacks, where the teenage girl and her boyfriend were found ripped apart, she actually was able to get off a cell phone call to her sister and said something the reception was apparently bad, said that they were being attacked by large dogs. Now, I don't speak Spanish, so I've not been able to read it into all the media reports, but some suggest that that's not the exact translation, that what she actually said was some, like, strange large dogs, that there was something unusual about it, saying, please, come quick, help, and then, bam, the phone died, almost as though whatever was attacking her knew to knock the phone out of commission right away. And you saw that in the case with Lothar, Schwederer, who'd been killed, that he'd gotten his phone out even as he was putting up a fight, but that he's disabled or incapacitated almost as soon as that phone comes into play, almost as though whatever's doing the tax knows to stop the ability of a human to contact other humans to try to call for help, that they know this is a means that humans use for communication. And I just found it strange that she was only able to get out essentially seconds of a panicked message. And when her sister got it, she first thought that it was some kind of joke. I mean, her sister's just at the park with her boyfriend. You're not expecting that. So, But she tries to call back and immediately no answer. And then her sister's found there with her boyfriend. They're both mutilated. So you have two teenagers, the classic horror movie setup. They go off into the lover's lane type area to make out or spend time alone together. And then something gets them. And in Mexico, at least, we had the issue come up immediately in the local papers where people were questioning it. A lot of people thought, well, is this the cartel that's doing it? Is this a cover-up for something else? But the official story was dogs, and here we have a report of someone saying something about large, strange dogs while it happened. Yet, in general, no witnesses, and the people are being picked off when they're either alone, at the edge of the park, or somehow separated. And in Mexico, this is taking place right at the outskirts of Mexico City, one of the largest cities, certainly in North America. I think there's a population of, what, 25 million people? So it just goes to suggest that even the very outskirts of our urban areas aren't as safe as we'd like to think. For whatever it was to be able to take out five people like that, by itself, that says everything about its ability. Almost as though it's a serial killer, because you'll have two people dead one month, three people the next, and here's another one. And there was some indication that it being Mexico, that the authorities stopped publicizing how many cases were actually taking place owing to their failure to prevent it, and that other deaths and disappearances were, of course, possibly occurring in the area. Mexico City has its crime problems, so it's almost as though what got lost in the shuffle. If we know about these, what ones don't we know about? It sure does make you wonder. Let's talk about the Edward Cahill case. The Edward Cahill case is interesting to me in that it harkens back to that case we talked about in New Jersey with the woman who'd bred dogs, and then her house was found shredded, almost as though what the police described as a monster had gotten inside. And I'm wondering if this isn't the beginning of a pattern of cases, I'm just noticing them. Edward Cahill, he was an adult male. He owned two pit bulls. He lived with his girlfriend and her son. Girlfriend and her son leave to go do errands, leaving him at home with his dogs that he's had for years. When she comes home, she finds him in the living room. The living room's been shredded, torn about. It looks like there's been a war in there. He's dead. He's torn to bits. One of his two pit bulls is found later cowering in the back bedroom, hiding. The other pit bull, the one that eventually gets the blame for it, is laying calmly next to him. And it's got some blood on its muzzle, and it's got blood splatters on its coat. 
So to the investigators, this is an open and shut case. They say, oh, well, his dog must have turned on him. It must have got angry at him. And these things just happen. Does it just happen? Because here's his dog. He's had it for years. It never decided to eat him before. It never really hurt him before. It's his dog. He's friendly with it. Nothing was unusual about this day except the fact that he was suddenly alone. And he had these large dogs in his house. Now, we know that whatever does some of these attacks seems to prey on large domestic dogs. So this case stuck in my mind, and this is one of the things that I want to look more at as to whether or not this is another pattern of people who we are told are killed by their own pet dogs, yet it's happening when they're alone, when the place will be just torn apart, and if it's just suggested that it was the dog because it's a usual suspect sort of deal. Now, no one ever analyzed the dog's stomach to see if parts of the guy were in it, to see if it actually had blood in its mouth. All we know is that it had blood in its muzzle, which could have very easily happened if after its owner's killed, if it licks it, and that it had blood on its coat, but it was laying there near his body almost as if it was trying to protect him, even though he'd been so badly mutilated. So it, it seemed to me just a strange case, that it's something that just kind of raised some alarm bells in my mind as to whether this is yet another pattern that no one's noticed because no one's really looked at it or tried to think outside the box. It's a case where we know these deaths are happening, so we have to ask ourselves, well, are there really this many cases where people's dogs that they've had for years just suddenly turn on them for no apparent reason, or are people occasionally being killed in their own home with the house being ransacked, violently destroyed, and the dog, if it happens to be there, is just taking the blame? because no one knows what else to say. Do we want to say an, an unknown predator finds its way into people's houses, rips them to shreds? Do we want people thinking about that? Or do we want everyone to sleep better at night? So we just say, oh, well, dogs sometimes must turn on people. But I don't know. It's just something that raised questions in my head as to what really may have happened here, especially because it happened during a very brief window of about two hours when his girlfriend and her son were gone and he was alone in the house. So it just seemed that there were some coincidences involved. And the other thing that stuck out in this case was that it happened on Christmas Day. That's, again, a bit of folklore that stuck in my head, that quote-unquote werewolves, which would be a, how people would describe these canine predators in the past, were active around Christmas time. So that this happened on Christmas Day happened when he was alone for just a few hours. The dogs had not been a problem with him before. It just raised some alarm bells in my head. Is this another pattern that's going unrecognized of attacks? When you're researching this case, did you turn up any info on whether or not his house was ransacked and looked like a monster had been set loose in the house, the way you mentioned with that other case last week? Well, one of his two dogs was in the bedroom. That door was closed. And then he and the other dog were found in the living room, which did look as though there'd been some sort of struggle taking place. You had furniture knocked over. You had broken items. It basically looked like he'd fought. That's interesting, too, because there's the mention of the blood in the dog, but the dog itself that takes the blame didn't seem to be wounded. And here you had a muscular, strong young man you would think that if his living room was torn to shreds from fighting whatever got to him, that if it was his dog that got to him, why isn't the dog bruised? Why isn't the dog injured? He obviously went down swinging, so why isn't the dog hurt? Why is it just laying there quietly, almost protective of its dead master? And that was another thing that bothered me about this case. Almost suggesting that something gets in, perhaps going after the human, perhaps going after these dogs as prey, the homeowner will resist, put up a heck of a good fight, but still fail. It makes you wonder just how safe you are, even in your own house. We know these deaths occurred. Someone can say, well, maybe it wasn't that mysterious after all, or they could question my line of reasoning, but they can't say these deaths didn't occur. They can't say that the place wasn't ransacked. They can't say that it didn't happen on Christmas Day. There's just these odd things that stick in your mind. Yeah, they're definitely pretty odd. For all of you listening, in the pre-interview, Christopher was telling me that not only has he put a lot of research into cases like the ones that you heard on tonight's show and on last week's show, 
He's also put a lot of research into cases that involved hunters being killed by an unknown canine predator. He also told me in that same conversation he'd be happy to come back and do a show on that once he had a chance to get his notes together on that subject. Christopher, I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to having you back to do that show. Could you give us a preface on it? Yes. Some of this comes up again in the Missing 411 books, but I think David Polides wasn't looking at the pattern that we're going to find here. There seems to be cases, particularly of bow hunters, hunters who don't have firearms, Either they are found mutilated in the woods after hunting, or they are found dead under mysterious circumstances without a cause of death being released, or they simply go out hunting one day and are never seen again. And I think there's an entire subcase of hunters, mostly bow hunters, a few firearms hunters, who, if we look at it, are being found mutilated, dead, or just going missing that we will find match somewhat our pattern that we've talked about here with either clothes missing or it's being said to be dogs or in some cases it's just covered up completely. I see. Well, I can't tell you how much I'm looking forward to doing that show with you. I'm happy to get the information out there. Well, you know it's appreciated. Like I said before, once you have your notes together on that and you're ready to go, please do let me know. Well, it's about time to wrap this show up. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to make? I think that if there's something I'd like people to come away from this with, it's the idea that these things aren't killing people isn't true, that they are dangerous, that at least some of these deaths are probably caused by what people are referring to dog man or werewolves or I like to think of it as an unknown canine predator and that I think a certain amount of wariness might be in order. It's happening more than we've realized. It's certainly happening, and it's getting labeled as other things. The victims are often the most vulnerable members of society, especially our children. I think I've just encouraged a certain amount of wariness. If nothing else, since we know that there are children being taken from their own yards and killed by something, I would just stress keep an eye out on your kids. Just don't take for granted that you're safe. As you might have thought, there are predators out there, that there are monsters that are real, and to just try and be prepared. And I would also suggest that if, God forbid, you are attacked, that maybe the best thing to do is put up a fight. We know several cases where apparently the attackers were driven off by men with clubs. We know cases where people fought and were killed, but some cases where it almost seems like juveniles of the predators were responsible for the attacks where they could be driven off. So I would simply suggest that if someone is set upon that maybe putting up a fight is the best way to deal with it. At least make them work for it if they're going to take you. And that may seem morbid, but that's about the only solace I can take from reading about again and again where these people are being taken. I do have an email address I set up this is ongoing research for me, which I simply set up as dogmanevents at gmail.com. And if anyone wants to write me with any comments or to tell me of other cases that I've missed or how they followed up on these patterns or just their opinion, I'm happy to hear from them. I don't do this full time. I don't take any money from it. I don't make any money off this at all. So if anyone out there has anything they want to contact me or ask any questions, I just say, feel free to drop me an email. and I'll just respond as best I can as time allows. Well, thanks so much for spending time with us, Christopher, and sharing those stories. I really do appreciate it. And like I said earlier, once you have those notes ready, please do let me know so we can do that follow-up show. As soon as I get the presentation together, and I've got quite a number of cases that we can go through in a manner similar to how we've discussed these other attacks. I think your listeners may find it interesting information certainly something to keep in mind next time they go in the woods. 